Hello and welcome to this session on introducing the programmable sock that we're going to be using in the Hello Ultra 96 webinars coming up soon. So for those unfamiliar with the uh, Zinc MP sock that's fitted to the Ultra 96, it's a unique class of device called the Heterogeneous System on Chip. Now, what makes this unique is actually within the processing system, we have a number of processing elements, the application processing unit, the graphics processing unit, and the real-time processing unit. But we also have, coupled with that, programmable logic. Now, this programmable logic is based on the latest and the most advanced uh, FPGA architecture from the Xilinx Ultrascale range. So this gives us an, a, a real good ability to offload uh, functionality from the processing system into the programmable logic. Uh, and when we do that, obviously, we get a, quite, a, a really good acceleration, a really good performance increase. And we're going to look through these few slides. We're going to, I'm going to introduce you to concepts of what the what the heterogeneous sock is, introduce its processing system, introduce programmable logic, and then introduce a little bit about the development flow as we work through this. So the first thing to mention actually is in the system, the PS is the master. So that is the one that boots first. That is the one that, that configures then the programmable logic. So this means that during operation, if we want, we can load in several different programmable logic overlays or, or programmable logic applications. Uh, obviously, the, the processing system is actually hard implemented in silicon, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of flexibility in there. So we can configure interfaces with, with ease. So we can configure whether, particularly on the connectivity side of things, we can configure whether we want to, to root out an SPI port or an I squared C port or even a gig E port. And that gives us real flexibility. We're going to be looking at that in session one of the Hello Ultra 96 uh, series. Now, obviously, we have the programmable, we have the processing system and the programmable logic, and we want to be able to communicate between the two. So to do that, we have the AXI bus, which connects between the PS and the PL, or the PL and the PS. And in both directions, it provides interfaces which are both master and slave, allowing the PL or the PS to be the master, depending upon the data, tran data transfer to be, to be initiated. Now, AXI is actually just a memory map protocol, so to the processor system, it's just another memory write or just another DMA configuration to move everything from the P, from the PS to the PL or, or vice versa. We also have the ability to define clocks for our processing system and supply those into the programmable logic. So there are four fabric clocks that we can configure. So we can configure the clocking frequency that we want to clock our programmable logic at. And of course, with that comes the resets necessary to, re to reset that clock tree if, if so desired. There's another aspect that we can do. So there, there's a, another bunch of interconnects that are classed as other on this diagram. And they contain the, the interrupts that go between the processing Processor system and the programmable logic or programmable logic and process system. They contain debug information, debug signals such that it's possible to put a integrated logic analyzer within the programmable logic, wait for that to trigger, and then when that does trigger, to, to actually stop and breakpoint the software running in the processing system. So as we can really, as the system's quite quite well well closely coupled, we can actually see what's going off between between one and the other. And of course we can do that in the other way around, we can hit a breakpoint in the software, we can use that to trigger a integrated logic analyzer within the programmable logic. So let's take a look in a little bit more detail at what's actually contained within the processing system. And so on the zinc, the uh, the zinc that's fitted to the ultra scale, uh, to the ultra 96, we have quad core ARM A53 processors. Now these are 64 bit processors. They have, of course, the neon unit, the floating point unit, and everything that would be expected for for working with high level operating systems and hypervisors so as such that the apu has really been designed to work with virtualization as well coupled to that obviously we have the we have the Mali gpu closely closely connected to the apu so we can program that using OpenGL, and we can we can use that for generating desktops and and doing some calculations there we also have the real-time processing unit now, the real-time processing unit, whose role is for applications maybe where we need real-time critical control. So that may be for IEC 61508 or ISO 26262 applications. And it runs in two, two modes. It can run in a lockstep mode where both processor cores run, run synchronous to, together in lockstep and its results are compared on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis. Or we can have it running in what's called the split mode, in which case both cores are running independently. 
When it comes to configuration and security, we have the configuration security unit. Now this provides all the secure boot support for Trust Zone, and it also provides a number as we're going to look at actually in the in the session one. It also provides a number of hard encrypted IP blocks that allow us to do AES encryption, AES decryption, RSA multiplication and SHA calculation. So that's really quite key to our security aspects, particularly when it comes to implementing things like IoT and, and so on. We have the platform management unit. The platform management unit really does what, the, what does what it says on the tin. It manages a platform. So the platform management unit allows us to power on and power off power nodes and power islands within the design. So we can really customize the power dissipation of the processing system and the programmable, programmable logic. And obviously we have a DDR3 control to store our applications in. Now both the APU and the RPU can access that DDR control and their applications can be stored within it. But also it's possible due to the AXI interconnect to actually transfer data from the, proce from the programmable logic into the processing systems DDR. So that's really useful when you want to do perhaps an image processing task where you want to have an image processing pipeline in the programmable logic because it's fast, it's responsive. But actually at some point you need to transfer some of the image or process data into the DDR, into the DDR for the PS. So it should the PS can then access that and start working on its high level decisions or maybe communicate that communicate that further on. Now when we develop for these devices it's quite a we have quite a complex development structure which is slightly different to perhaps how it how it may be and in that we initially we need a hardware software specification obviously to define our to define our requirements but we also need to define what we're going to implement in the hardware and what we're going to implement in the software once we've done that we can then take a look at what's available within the Vivado IP library using that Xilinx IP integrator but if there's not sufficient IP, then we may need to create our own IP. And to do that, we can use Verilog, VHDL, or we can use HLS. Once we've created that IP block, we can include it within our IP integrator design, and we can we can move on and we can generate our hardware description. That hardware description will contain the configuration of the Zinc processing system it's, and the configuration of the programmable logic. But it won't actually contain any of the software that we actually intend to execute upon the upon the zinc and we do that we do that within uh, Xilinx SDK or if we're using an operating system like we will be in some of our sessions we use a we use a operating system such as Petalinux and we use a tool chain such as Petalinux to create to create that operating system and then we can finally create our applications in SDK hopefully by the end of this stage obviously the the design and the overall system meets the requirements initially if not then we have to iterate around the back around the loop again but hopefully it does meet that requirement and we can we can progress on. Now, as I said, this is kind of a unique class of device because it contains both processing cores and programmable logic. Now, when we look into the programmable logic, what we what we will find is that this programmable logic is re really represented by a sea of a sea of gates, as you can see there in the diagram there. So inside the blue block, we have what is called a a configurable logic block. Now that contains a flip flop, which is essentially a register, so that stores values in between clock cycles, and a lookup table. Now that lookup table can be configured to to represent any uh, logic gate or any logic gate function so it can do and and or and 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 any, anything that you want and we'll take a look at how it does that exactly in, in a minute or two but that allows that allows this this com this configurable logic block to actually be able to implement any logic function that we should desire and obviously because it wants flexibility there's a number of multiplexes in there to allow the output of the uh, lookup table to bypass the uh, flip-flop if, if storage is not required in between clocks or we can have storage or, or maybe actually the input doesn't come from the lookup table the input comes directly so that that multiplexing gives obviously the best way gives the most flexibility to the CLB and how it's how it's configured obviously interconnecting these CLBs is a switch box now that switch box is used to interconnect several uh, several CLBs uh, to do the routing that's necessary to implement the logic function that we want. Now, when we design our FPJ, when we design our, our Ultra 96 solution and we accelerate logic from the processing system into the programmable logic, we're not going to be working at this level. We're not going to be defining what's in the, what whether we want a flip flop or not here, or whether we want what what configuration we want our lookup table to to be in. We're actually going to be using higher level languages than that. We're going to be using VHDL, Verilog. Or, high, or even better than that, we're going to be using high-level synthesis, so we're going to be designing this in C or C++. But it's really important, actually, that we that we understand the logic, uh, what what actually our design gets map, mapped into and translated into at the end of the day, because we need to we need to kind of think a little bit about our hardware when we go through and do this. So when we look at a uh, when we look inside a logic 
a lookup table. What we'll see is it has a number of inputs. In this instance, is a free input lookup table. And we can configure depend the values for those lookup values. We can set those to be in either 1 or a 0. And in doing that, we can implement AND gates, OR gate, NAND gates, NOT gates, such on. And as you can see in this example here, we have a fairly simple logic circuit on the left hand side that we've implemented using a using a lookup table so that really gives the fpj and programmable logic a lot of flexibility now this example is a free input lookup table but actually when you look at a uh, ultra scale plus architecture you can have a six input lookup table or dual five input lookup tables in a single configuration logic block so that gives us a real flexibility and real capability to implement some quite complicated logic solutions in a single in a single CLB, so it gives us gives us it's quite powerful for us to do that. So when actually we come to capture our come to capture our design, we can we actually capture this in what's called IP integrator, as as you saw in the design flow. So here is an example of what IP integrator is, and it's a very graphical flow. You can see there we have the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus block, and if you double click on that, as we will be doing in Lab One, you will see that there are several things that we can configure, such as uh, communication interfaces between the PS and the PL, clocking interfaces, the configuration of uh, EM, uh, MIO, such as the multiplexed IO is what outputs we break out. So it all gives us quite a lot of, of good flexibility there to configure that zinc. And then actually everything outside that block is actually also implemented within the programmable logic. So you can see there we have a AXI UART in there, and we also have a, a BRAM controller and a block memory generator. Now those BRAMs and such like that, we're going to be using those in session in session one. But actually, you know what? They could be anything. They could be our own custom logic code that we've just designed and we're, we're mapping in because it's just an address mapped peripheral that we're that we're putting in the programmable logic such that the such that the processing system, if it needs to, can access it. So that's a quick introduction to what IP integrator looks like. Now, as we go through this, as I mentioned earlier on, we may need in some circumstances to create our own uh, our own test bench, our own IP. So if we do that, then we will create a test bench which simulates the IP, and that does it does that by stimulating the inputs and monitoring the outputs. Now, test benches can be quite a detailed and in-depth application. Now, Vivado contains with it its own logic simulator, uh, and that allows us to simulate our IP designs, and we can do co-simulation as well if we use Vivado HLS. So we can simulate our C, and then we can do C, C to RTL simulation in, in HLS as well. But I just wanted to show this picture and present it, because actually when we work at the simulate our modules, if our IP modules we create, we work at a much lower level than we do in the software world typically we're looking at clock cycles and the values of buses and bits and state machines and counters on a cycle by cycle basis to verify and prove that the IP core is working as we would we would require. Now let's take a look back. We have a design, we've we've captured a design, we've implemented it in IP integrator, we've configured the zinc as we want, we've even done a little bit of test benching to test bench our IP and what we want to do now is we want to actually take our design that's sat in IP integrator, we want to convert that into a bit file that we can pass across into our software team such that they can implement the design and they can test it on that we can start testing on the hardware. So we need to go through several steps to do this. The first we need to go through is we need to go through what's called synthesis. Now synthesis actually takes the uh, design in VHDL or Verilog or even high level synthesis, which is written in a register transfer mode. So it contains state machines, it contains counters, but it essentially flow contains a flow of data between between registers. It doesn't actually detail how to do that using logic equations because it's written at a higher level. So this is where the synthesis tool comes in. And the synthesis tool basically goes away and creates the logic equations and the logic circuitry that needs to be loaded into the FPGA target resources. So from that, it gives you a net list which tells you all the configurations of lookup tables and such like for that to, to implement the logic circuit. But it doesn't actually fit. It, it doesn't actually fit that in the design in the FPGA. That's the job of the placer. So the placer takes that that synthesized net list and it attempts to map the the net list into the resources available within the within the FPGA. Now in these applications, it will obviously fit for our examples that we're going to be looking at on the Ultra 96. But in some cases, you may have a design that's too big to actually fit in the resources of your FPGA. You need to look at a, a larger device. But that placer will go through and it will place these back into the. So it's placing the functionality into the blue blocks that were present on the diagram a few a few slides ago, if you remember back. And that that gives the functionality to the to the design.
but it doesn't actually we can't actually implement the functionality at that point in time because none of these blue blocks are actually connected and that's where the next stage comes in which is routing now routing actually does all the interconnects in between the blue blocks to create to create the functionality that we wanted now it's when we do the routing that actually we can run into problems in terms of timing because blocks blocks may have been placed too far between each other and the clock and the routing tracks are, are, are therefore quite a distance and we can't achieve the operation at the clock frequency we want so we have to look at constraints or modifying the VHDL to actually allow us to get the to, to get the performance that we want for these applications and the the labs this is something that we're going to talk about but we don't have to worry about it too much and obviously finally once the routine is complete then it will do the bit file generation which runs a basic drc check on the design on the overall design as it generates the bit file and once we've got that bit file we can pass it across to our software team and they can they can use that and they can include that in the build going forwards now this was a real whistle stop tour of what logic is and what fpga development is if you want to know more about it, there's a couple of courses on Element 14. So one is pretty much a Logic 101, takes you all the way from Bull's initial concepts of Logic, all the way through to the, the sort of the culmination in the lookup table and a lot number of steps in between, such as what state machines are, counters are, how FPGAs do maths. It's all included in that course. And then the next one picks up, which is essentially the essentials of FPGA design, which contain how the how the uh, how you can design for FPGAs and the different types of FPGAs there are and, and the, the process flow for that. So those two courses are really worth a little bit of time and investment. They probably take half an hour to an hour each to do, but I would really recommend if you get a chance that you that you go and run through them prior to doing prior to doing this course. Now the final slide I want to talk about, the final thing I want to talk about really is just how we wrap this up and get this up and going in our system. So to do to do so to boot our zinc we need a we need a number of things. We need initially we need a first stage bootloader which we create in creating SDK. We then need a bit file that we can we can load into configure the programmable logic. Now that's actually optional if we just want to run the ARM cores we can we can write some software that just runs on the ARM cores and then add in the bit file later on but but if we want to utilize the device to its fullest extent then we need to have that programmable logic in there as well. Maybe if we're using a more advanced operating system such as uh, Peta Linux we might use a second stage bootloader and in that case we would use something like Uboot to actually go away and load the Peta Linux image and and get everything set up but that again is not always required if it is we can use the petal linux flows we're going to be looking at in section two to actually run us through that and and get us there and then finally once the operating system's loaded or the bit files programmed if we don't have a second stage bootloader we could actually run our, our application which we've created in sdk or we and, and we can integrate and, and run our solution there and hopefully our customers are happy our example works and everything's good so this is a really quick kind of overview into the development of the of the Zinc MP SOC that we're going to be using for the Hello World uh, Hello Ultra 96 course and I really look forward to uh, to seeing you all and teaching you how we're going to go and do this it's going to be a real whistle stop tour but it's going to give you a lot of a lot of skills a lot of knowledge and a lot of a lot of good good capabilities to learn how to really work with these devices and and get the best of them and yeah thank you very much